Welcome to the A Minute to Midnight show folks, this is Tony coming to you from New Zealand and I have with me today Bill Randalls, Pastor Bill Randalls who's been on the A Minute to Midnight show several times before and it's really nice to have you back again today Bill. It's always an honour Tony, God bless you. Yes, a a bit of a shame I didn't get to actually meet up with you in um, Iowa. Uh, but of course I met you in New Zealand when you were last here but my how different things are now to compared to uh, when you were in New Zealand in fact here now it's quite different from well, you know having been in Pennsylvania where we were wearing masks and social distancing and going through all that sort of once we got through the managed isolation here in New Zealand there are pretty much no one's wearing masks there's n- no social distancing being enforced in most cases except in doctor's surgeries and one or two other places and uh, there's no limits on crowd sizes or anything here so at the moment it's just completely different it feels like life's sort of normal but of course we know it's anything but normal right I'm really glad to hear that though it is spotty over here, too. There are some places that are way worse than others, but uh, this is definitely a phenomenon on the end times, that's for sure. It certainly is, um, and I think that's the topic of our subject today, really, is perilous times, isn't it? Yes, it is, Tony, but um, since, I mean, I've been praying about this show, and, and that's what came to me, the talk about perilous times, and the last times, perilous, the last days, perilous times shall come. But one of the things, too, that occurred to me, and I think it would be a great way to talk about this, is that we are in the middle of a Jewish holiday. It's an eight-day holiday. It's Hanukkah, the Feast of Dedication. And I'm struck by the uh, situation that Hanukkah portrays in comparison with our situation today. And I'd really like to talk about that because I believe these these holidays that God uh, gave us are very, very instructive and prophetic, as well as uh, memorials of historic events. And so I've been thinking a lot about the meaning of Hanukkah. And before I get into the detail of it, and please interject at any point you want, but uh, I really uh, have come to see the beautiful wisdom of Jewish holidays anyway, most of which are are totally ordained by God. And one of the things that sticks out with me is that they're all rooted in reality, okay? Like, for for example, really, like Passover, what was happening? Well, there was an oppressor, an antichrist, basically, the Pharaoh, and he was going to wipe out and commit genocide on God's chosen people in his war against the only true God, and God delivered them by the blood of the Lamb. That's Passover, okay? And then you have Purim, and that once again you have an oppressor, and he is tricked into giving it a, a decree, and then the Jewish people are going to be wiped out, until. but God intervened through Queen Esther, and that was the hand of God, even though, ironically, God's name isn't even mentioned in it. And Hanukkah is the same way. I mean, in other words, it's not some kind of sentimental, sappy, or philosophical thing that these holidays commemorate. They're rooted in the reality of this world, the sinfulness of man, the tendency for there always to be some kind of antichrist, persecution, and then deliverance. And Hanukkah is one of the starkest examples of this of this uh, kind of thing in in Scripture and in truth. But as a matter of fact, it is not one of the holidays like Purim that was ordained by God in Leviticus 23. It, 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 is, it was a later edition, but Jesus kept it. There, there's one place in the New Testament where Hanukkah is mentioned, and there's one person that in the New Testament focuses on as keeping that feast, and that is John chapter 10. He says Jesus was there in Jerusalem for the Feast of Dedication. That's another name for it. And uh, Jesus is the one person that is focused on as as keeping this feast. So Hanukkah is a completely valid uh, feast of of God. And, And basically what's been striking me about it is that the buildup to it, when you look in the history of it, uh, really speaks to our day because Hanukkah came um, as a result of a tremendous defection 
from true faith. In the in the time between the New Testaments is what, when it happened. Daniel predicted it, by the way, in detail. But what had happened is the Jewish people in their exile and and also in their in their return home were tired of holding on to their separation. It became a burden to them, especially in a time where the rage in the civilized world was something called Hellenism. Okay, uh, Alexander the Great had imposed Greek culture on the whole world, and then it was something that the world really, really embraced. And basically, that would be humanism, the worship of the human body, the worship of beauty, a lot of sexual perversion. And then standing against that almost by itself was uh, traditional biblical Judaism and the, uh, the circumcision and food laws and separation from the world. And pe people were just weary of it. And they were defecting in great numbers at the time leading up to the atrocity that is um, that Hanukkah commemorates. Even the high priest of Israel, who would be the most important religious figure in the only religion on earth that was even remotely true, the high priest of Israel dropped uh, his Hebrew name and took on a Greek name. I mean, can you imagine the demoralization? You, you know, what I think about, though, we're seeing this very same thing, okay? Leaders of the of the Southern Baptist, of all people, uh, one of the most, at one time conservative, one of the largest Protestant denominations in America, now publicly announcing that standing up against abortion is just a side issue. We should get rid of that. We should go with the flow of the world or other uh, denominations becoming soft on homosexuality and even uh, appeasing the homosexual lobby by uh, apologizing in the name of the church for our so-called atrocities against them. Th this is very similar to what was happening in the days leading up to Hanukkah, and, and it really struck me. In the last days, the Bible says, perilous times shall come. And when Paul gave us that verse in Timothy, it, it wasn't that he was talking about the Antichrist or the beast or the plagues or the earthquakes. He said what was going to make it a perilous time is that people would depart from the faith because they are lovers of self. Now, this is what we're facing now in, in our world. And we are also facing something extremely demoralizing to Christians, and that is the defection from the true faith of the powerful denominational leaders, even pastors, um, so-called uh, worship leaders, uh, youth leaders. M many, many, many people are just uh, accommodating the spirit of the world, just like in the days of Hanukkah. And uh, into this situation, a, a figure arose, a political figure. His name is Antiochus, but he took the title Antiochus Epiphanes, which means uh, the manifestation of God. So you got a leader who claimed to be a manifestation of God. And he, he kind of had an interesting life because he was pagan, he was Syrian, and his father was Syrian, and they were part of the Seleucid Empire, which controlled Israel with the breakup of Alexander the Great's empire. They got the part with the Holy Land. And this man, uh, his father had lost in a battle with the Romans, and the, as part of the peace, the Romans said, give us your son. So he was raised by Romans, and he eventually made his way back into the Holy Land, and there was, a, there was a king, but through intrigue and politics, he assumed the kingship, which is um, exactly what Daniel chapter 11 predicted would happen. And uh, the Jews had desired to make peace with the world by this extreme compromise with Hellenism. For example, the high priest of Israel took a Greek name. He built in Jerusalem, not many steps away from the temple, a gymnasium, which uh, in the modern world, we hear the word gymnasium, we think of the YMCA or something. But a gymnasium in those days was something entirely different. It was a completely Greek concept, a, a basically a temple of body worship, much nudity, 
and it was saturated with homosexuality as well. And so can you imagine uh, the high priest sanctioning a gymnasium within walking distance of the temple? Uh, and they thought by this way that they would make peace and compromise with the world and become the world's friend. But it worked the other way, okay, because this Antiochus uh, Epiphanes, who was already a madman calling himself God, uh, began a reign of terror. He, at first he plundered the temple, okay, and then he eventually uh, began to make laws against circumcision, and then he began to sanction these laws, like if a woman circumcised her child, he would kill her. They would kill him. They killed many, 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 many people in that day uh, for th possession of holy scrolls of scripture or circumcision of children, or they also were commanding the reversal of circumcision in men, which I, I don't even know how that could work. But what, what strikes me, uh, Tony, is this relevance to today. What we're seeing today is just so parallel to that. And this, this would become the darkest time uh, up until that time in all of Jewish history as this reign of terror. I mean, he eventually would turn the temple into a fortress. He decreed a world religion that everyone should submit to. He began to change the times and the laws. He forbid the uh, Torah. He outlawed the Sabbath. He forced some Jews to eat pig. And eventually, he offered a pig on the altar of God before an idol of Zeus. And that has a technical name. Our Savior uh, in Matthew 24, if you, if you understand the history leading up to Hanukkah, Ma Matthew 24 sounds like Jesus was giving a teaching about it because he said, um, when you see the abomination that makes desolate spoken of by Daniel the prophet, now, Daniel had predicted this 200 years earlier, that they, were, they would set up, this king from Syria would set up an abomination that makes the temple desolate. He would profane it to the point where it was unusable. It was, it was pig's blood on the altar and a, an altar and a statue of Zeus. He said, when you see that, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now, when people heard Jesus say that, they already were familiar with that concept because it had already happened 200 years earlier, and everybody knew it happened. And one of the things that they did, that was the, that was the point of no return for them. They, uh, they immediately, uh, anyone that was still faithful to God and trying to maintain faith, they fled to the wilderness of Judea so that they could regroup, and a, and a rebellion started, which eventually would up, upend this, uh, this pagan government. Well, Jesus said, it's going to happen again. He said, the reader of Daniel is going to understand that there's going to be another uh, abomination that makes the temple mount de uh, desolate. And when you see it, he said to those in Judea, flee to the wilderness of Judea. And so uh, prophecy often comes in repetitive uh, patterns. <laughs> I realize I'm doing all the talking, Tony. Oh, I'm that's sorry. all right. No, no, it's I'm like, I, it's, it's I, fascinating, actually. I've, I've got a lot, yeah, on my heart because I've been looking at this, you know, and I'm and I'm realizing, you know, that uh, the 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 sacrilege, the the ultimate desolation. It was the signal, okay? And Jesus uh, talking about history, uh, but yet saying, no, it's going to happen again. And, of course, Daniel said the same thing. It would happen again at the end of time. Well, look, we're, we're, it's, in, it's in the environment of massive, massive defection from the Christian faith. Hang on. I just, just want just to— like can I just interject yeah. you? What about the people that are like preterists or whatever they, and they're saying, well, no, this was full, all fulfilled um, in 70 AD, you know, and they say, no, you know, this, this is not a future event that it's already been fulfilled. How, how do you talk to those people about it? Yeah. yeah I, look, my answer to them is, th is this, that uh, there's, a, there's a misunderstanding about prophecy, but even, even uh, what Jesus said about Daniel would be the answer to it. 
the, the, pers- the people listening to Jesus in Matthew 24, that would be one of the most familiar things in their history is what happened 200 years earlier with Antiochus Epiphanes. In other words, in their sense, that happened. That's a past. And Jesus is saying, no, uh, you, if you really read it, Daniel, you'll understand it's going to happen again. See, that's the thing. Pro- prophecy, 70 AD was a partial fulfillment of much of this. But it's not completely fulfilled. For example, immediately after Matthew 24, there's Matthew 25. The the sheep and the goats have not been divided yet. The final judgment has not come. Okay, so 70 AD points to it. So does uh, Antiochus Epiphanes point to it. But we're coming to this head again. And all those things were just preliminary things. You see what I'm saying? That's what I'd say to a preterist. It's going to happen again. And what happens is it's like a vortex. It just keeps going around and around with increasing intensity. For example, Jesus said about um, in Matthew 24 that then shall be tribulation such as the world has never seen before, nor will ever see again. Okay. Now, look. 70 AD was unprecedented. I agree. The temple was raised to the ground again, just as in the Babylonian days. The world's slave markets were glutted with the Jewish population, and a million Jews were killed by the, through the war with the Romans. And there was no Israel for 2,000 years, right? But look, the Holocaust it, 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 the Holocaust, in a sense, even dwarfs that, because even in exile, one third of all the Jews in the world was slaughtered. Okay, so you, so when Jesus said, "You, there will be tribulation like the world's never seen before and never see it again," look, the the Holocaust dwarfs seventy A.D. So it has to be a repetitive pattern until the the final tribulation. And Jesus is not given to hyperbole. He said. Tribulation like the world's never seen before, nor has it ever seen again. Okay. Well, I would say, you know, in my in my view, I mean, the Holocaust is worse than 70 AD even. I mean, I mean, it just keeps going on and on and on until the final trial, the final conflict, and the final deliverance of Israel. I mean, you know, the, the exile was still on. I mean, the Jews are not all back in their land. So that's what I would say to a preterist. I, I would agree with them. I am kind of preteristic, although I'm futuristic. Yes, these, these things happen over and over and over again. But they're all leading to the final and complete and intense fulfillment of these prophecies. So the people and that... Hanuk- um- the people that that come up with saying that the book of Revelation's already been fulfilled, I really shake my head at those people because there are so many things in the book of Revelation that no way have been fulfilled yet. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. It, it couldn't have been fulfilled. Nor you couldn't even you couldn't even say legitimately the devil's been bound. <laughs> okay. Yeah. If if the devil's been bound, I mean, what what? How do you explain what's going on in the world? No, we have not come into the millennium yet. Um, I'm waiting for that day, okay? But no, yeah, the people that that say that, I mean, they don't understand that, look, uh, yes, if you, like, if you looked very closely at what, uh, what happened around 70 AD, you could, you could come to that conclusion that, wow, then all that stuff happened just like, because it's, it's, it's uncanny how it looks to fulfill scripture. But the thing is, it never completely fulfills. And remember also that 20, Matthew 24 cannot be separated from Matthew 20, 25. Okay, there has not been a, na- an, a, a national judgment where the goat nations and the sheep nations are, are separated. That just hasn't happened. So that's my answer to that. I'm definitely a futurist, although I, I believe that there have been partial fulfillments of this. Mm, and and yeah. Hanukkah, Hanukkah is a God ordained uh, reminder. See, all, all the all these things. Uh, of course, people try to secularize Jewish holidays just like they try to secularize Christian holidays. Okay, Hanukkah is a reminder not just of 
um, a miracle with oil, which that's really what the whole focus is, the miracle of oil, that they finally did take the temple. And then there's, and it's not in the Bible, it's not predicted by Daniel, but the, the Jews do say it. I, I, I have no idea, so I'll take their word for it, that they needed to consecrate. Um, the holy lamp could not be lit without holy oil, and they only had enough for one day and it would take a week to get the holy recipe together and make another batch but they lit the candle for the holy candelabra for one day and the oil lasted for eight days which i think is beautiful really and that's why you see these candle lighting ceremonies that people have and i think that's fantastic in fact my wife in in love just bought me a candelabra uh, because I just think that, that that Jewish candelabra is a beautiful, beautiful piece. But anyway, look though, the, even that is symbolic of something I think that is even a deeper truth, and that is that in a time of almost complete defection from the Jewish faith, in a time of like satanic pressure, and particularly the defection of the powerful. The real miracle of the oil is that a remnant of Jews would not be snuffed out in almost near total darkness. So that, to me, is a greater miracle than the miracle about the lamp, okay, is that there were people in that dark time that kept their faith and that their light shined and they could not be snuffed out, even though some of them were being called upon to give their lives as a martyr for the truth. And they did. They willingly, the Jews willingly gave up their lives for Sabbath. They gave up their lives for circumcision. They gave up their life for the Torah and the scrolls. They they were slaughtered by uh, the government forces and and by the defectors also, but they would not relent. And it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't a majority as always. It was a tiny minority. But then that kept uh, the true faith of Judaism, which was the only real faith on earth until Christ came, um, from being utterly put out. And that is something to commemorate. And it, but unfortunately so, now, the, 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 you know, most of the current Jews have rejected, the, rejected Jesus you know, as Lord and Savior, and they're following the, the Talmud, basically, right. which is, again, is a distortion of Judaism as well. It's not even pure... Judaism, so yeah, you're, you're you're right, you're right, and 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 that's but that's the other thing though that's connected with this, that's right, and but God said even even, even Isaiah Isaiah had a picture of us of Israel as like a smoldering stump with no life left, whatever. It's almost like it's completely destroyed. But then all of a sudden he sees a shoot come out of it, and the Messiah himself is called the shoot or the branch. Okay, see. Always he will keep a remnant. It almost looks like it's completely wiped out, like Isaiah predicted. Unless the Lord had mercy on us, we would have been like Sodom and Gomorrah, but the Lord has preserved a remnant. Well, where is that remnant now? The remnant are those Messianic Jews who confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and recognize him as their Messiah. The Lord will not allow it to be stamped out. So basically, you could say the Messianic Jews are the Hanukkah miracle personified, okay, because that lamp will not go out. There will always be a remnant. And, of course, we long for the day, one day soon, when all Israel shall be saved. A deliverer shall come to Zion and remove all iniquity in one day. And that is that is the promise. But what 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 has to happen between now and then? Well, Antiochus Epiphanes is just a foreshadowing of the ultimate uh, madman who claims to be God, okay? Like, not only did Jesus use Hanukkah language in Matthew 24, but Paul also, when he said, uh, the wicked one shall be revealed, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped as God, so that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself to be God. Okay, once again, the hearers of Paul and Jesus, the Jews, that's who their original audience was, the synagogues, they all knew that language as something that happened 200 years previously. But what's radical is Paul and Jesus both are saying, no, that did happen, but it's only pointing to something 
that's even more ultimate than that that's going to happen of the same nature. Another one is going to rise up who will appear to be the friend of the Jews, but through intrigue and peace, they will uh, open up to him, but then he'll turn on them, just like Antiochus did, and do his level best to wipe them out because he'll be inspired by Satan. And uh, it, it's it's funny, too, because even in Paul's language in Second Thessalonians, boy, I hope I'm making sense, but he says, uh, then shall that wicked one be revealed, Second Thessalonians 2, whom the Lord shall destroy with the breath of his mouth, and with the brightness of his coming. But you know what's interesting? The Greek word for brightness is epiphany. Okay, so and basically um, Antiochus epiphanies, Antiochus the fake manifestation of God. Okay, well, there will be another one in the end days, but the real epiphany, the real manifestation of God is going to be the, the parousia or the coming of the Messiah, and he will make short work of this Antiochus Epiphanes and utterly destroy him and his worldwide following, um, which, which, by the way, I do believe it. Instead of being a local thing, the, the last manifestation is worldwide. There, there is a congregation of Antichrist, and there is a fake bride of Antichrist that's being formed in opposition to the true Christ and the true bride of Christ. And do you see that um, the apostate church is being a big part of that? Yes. Yes. Just as apostate Jews, not only were they part of it, but they formed the atmosphere in the days of Hanukkah. This is one of the great lessons of the Hanukkah story, is that it was already defection that was so profound, such an embrace of Hellenism, which is basically uh, humanism, a really powerful strain of humanism, and the perversion that comes along with that, the worship of the self, the worship of the body, the anti-God posture, okay? Uh, it, was, it was because the Jews had po- uh, apostatized so thoroughly that there could be an atmosphere for someone like Antiochus to rise up right in the midst of them. And um, they were not ready because they couldn't they didn't judge his true intentions it says by flattery he destroys many daniel predicts all this okay it's just it's just incredible really i mean the word of god is incredible brother is so relevant to our day so so let me kind of get this um in my head so are you sort of thinking um that there are sort of like two uh, there's apostate Christians that, on the one hand, you know, the church is falling away, yes. and that so that's, and then there's a remnant of true Christians that are, are just, you know, in Gentile in general, Jewish and Gentile type Christians, and you've got yep. also the the Jews are in the essence an apostate today. You know, you've got them in Israel and wherever else around the world, but they're basically away from the truth. But there's a remnant of those that are basically Messianic Jews, so. It's sort of like two yes. remnants. Well, they're combined, I guess, in a sense. Yes, yes. Look, look. In the book, uh, the book of Revelation twelve talks about the red dragon that hates the woman, and the woman is the true people of God, right? And he goes after her seed because he can't stop Christ from coming. And her seed are those who keep the commandments of God and who bear the testimony of Jesus Christ. Okay, the devil hates them. See, the devil was in in obviously in. Antiochus Epiphanes. Everything he was doing, he was led by Satan. And that that was because it was very near the time of the first coming of Messiah, right? So he wanted to wipe out Israel and everything like that. Well, the devil is in Antichrist, obviously. The wicked one should be revealed, all right? He, the devil is in him, and now he's. it's because the timing is because we're very near the second coming of Christ. And what lends credence or sets a milieu for the devil's rise through this false imposter is apostasy. Now, now Judaism, you're right, Judaism itself, though whatever that term is, it's not the Judaism of the Bible. It's certainly not the Judaism of Elijah, Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah. This Judaism, uh, the, 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 I hate to say it, but 
Jeremiah 2, my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and they've hewn out broken cisterns that can't hold water. This Judaism is a dead letter. Uh, I've been struck lately, Tony, and I've been doing a lot of writing on my blog about this, about how many apostate Christians suddenly find themselves attracted to these real charismatic Pharisaic rabbis, believe yeah. it or not, they're, they're modern Pharisees, okay? And they are going, so, uh, quote unquote, going Torah, which is a complete apostasy. They, they are apostatizing to an apostate religion, okay? So this is crazy. They're not even apostatizing to anything even remotely biblical, although it gives a lot of lip service to Torah. They are literally Christian people apostatizing to an apostate religion. And one of the uh, buzzwords is the no-hide, no-hide movement, okay? Yeah. Which is a kind of a, a righteousness that the Pharisaic rabbis have constructed for Gentiles yeah. because we're not even good enough to be Jews by their standards. So yeah. they constructed this fake righteousness. Well, to embrace Noahidism is to renounce the only real righteousness that's available, and that is the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. It, it, people don't even know they're apostatizing. They actually think they're going into a deeper spirituality, but they're listening to apostates, and they are submitting to apostate false prophets. It's really frightening. And guess what? It takes them. And I've seen this, Tony, over and over and over again online. I've seen former Christian pastors getting up and saying, I, I renounced my belief that Jesus is God. I realize that's a, a idolatry and that's an abomination. Please, you know, may I be forgiven by um, Hashem, they say, and because I no longer believe that Jesus is God. Well, the Bible says, unless Jesus himself said, unless you believe that I am, you yeah. will die in your sins. Yeah. We are living in a day of tremendous apostasy, and I think it's going to lead to Antichrist. Yes, that's a good point. So on a practical level, how do we apply this knowledge? You know, what, what should we do with it on a practical level sort of thing today? Sure, sure. Well, for, for one thing, I really do believe that people need to, to realize uh, the times they're living in. You know, the Bible talks about sons of Isker knew the times. We are living in a time just like the time right before Hanukkah of a tremendous defection from true Christian faith. Now, there are several other really practical factors that are re really accelerating this. For one, the just the total almost overnight shutdown of churches. Yeah. It, it's got a it's got a really really evil function and it's got a really true function. Okay, on the, on the true side and the way it could work good is if you're going to a church that's already apostate and then they shut it down and you realize you know what I don't even yeah I don't know what I ever got out of that and then if it leads you to look online or somewhere even in the flesh for a real church that truly preaches the Bible and the new birth and is faithful and loyal to Jesus then I suppose that that shutdown will do you good. But one of the things our Lord showed me when this shutdown happened, and I knew it was going to happen, and I, it breaks my heart, is that that is a, pure, a purging that of many people, that sh their church is shut down, will never come back to church, okay? Yeah. They won't go at all. They can find out, oh, you know what, what, what did that do for me? Well, good. Now, look, if you're really Christian, you won't live without church. Now, I'm not saying organized church that's, you know, ornate and big, huge liturgy and everything. I'm saying church in the sense of where two or more are gathered. Now, I'm, I'm saying that there's sacraments. There is uh, everything revolves around the word of God. There, there is a mission to, to evangelize. There's people in charge that can, uh, can offer church discipline and direction. I, but you, you, a true Christian will not live without church. We know we pass from death to life because we love the brethren. God doesn't have a plan B, okay? He said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, back in the days of the Mac Maccabees, and time and time again also, you get these situations where the churches themselves defect, and yet the true remnant will gather with people of like mind and keep their faith. I mean, it's just a matter of survival. I can't live without God, and I can't live without church. I won't live without church. 
I'll have church one way or the other because I got to have church. I got to meet with other people, worship Jesus Christ. I got to have someone hand me a piece of bread and say, this is my body and a cup and say, this is my blood. I got to have that kind of accountability and prayer. I just won't live without it. But many people are, will. And basically these purgings and shutdowns and lockdowns have accelerated this. So uh, that's that's one of the main things is that realize where we're living, what's going on, and cling to Christ and to each other and to the Word. Well, what about people that are very... having having trouble finding like minded believers? Though, like I see that a lot right. in comments, particularly on YouTube videos and and different things like that. People saying we can't find a church, or do you see you know do you know anywhere? you know, where there's good fellowship and there's a lot of people that are struggling to actually find it. Yeah, Tony, I agree with that. And look, I've I've done a lot of praying about that because for years, I mean, for as long as I've been writing and had kind of a public life, I get letters from people. What is the problem? I can't find a church. And I didn't used to believe that that was even possible, but now I do. And I accept that. And I asked God for direction. And I do believe that he gave me a really important, verse, and I'd like to share it with our audience, and that's Malachi chapter 3, verse 16 through 18, which says, Then those that feared the Lord spoke often one with another, and their words were written in the book of remembrance, and they shall be mine, saith the Lord, when I come to separate my jewels from this earth and take them. So basically what the Lord has shown me, and, and by the way, it's much easier to fulfill this verse now with the internet than ever is that if nothing else, find a group of like-minded people and pray together and read the Bible together and glorify Jesus together, okay? And also remember, look, if the church changes, and it does, so many of them have, even before all these troubles, the churches were already just changing so much. If the church changes, that's time to remember that we're a pilgrim people. Okay, we don't have an, any fixed abode here. So someone says, what am I going to do? My church changed. Then get out of it and find someone, some other group of people. And if they change, then go find some other group of people. Okay, we we got to have fellowship. And uh, we it's never been easier to find it. Now, I don't believe online fellowship can take the place of real, personal, concrete fellowship. Although there is a rich supply of teaching online, there is, there are churches that are real that have their worship service streaming. There, you could get your own bread and cup and join them for fellowship. You can open your home and have two or three others. There are, you could watch uh, DVDs and videos or YouTube of some of the greatest preaching around, but you got to be discerning, okay? So on the one hand, I, I, it's really, really tough. On the other hand, there's never been a better time for it. Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 it, it does. So where can those listening to this um, find you online? Well, I have a we have a YouTube channel. I have about five hundred sermons on it, and we do we uh, do every one of our sermons, put them up on YouTube. It's called Believers in Grace Fellowship. We also have a Facebook page where we stream, and it's Believers in Grace Fellowship on Facebook. And every service we have, which is Sunday morning and Wednesday evening, uh, we stream, and we even include the worship and the communion on the streaming. Now we don't we don't do that on YouTube. But, um, you know, that, and uh, look, I'm just one of many, okay? There, there are so many. See, what I found is like the really big popular people, I mean, some of them are really great, some, are, some aren't so good, but there are so many obscure people out there just holding out the word, you know, and just preaching. And, and the YouTube and everything else has given us kind of platforms that we'd never have in any other time or place, but... I do have a sense of destiny that God has ordained all of us and everyone that's listening to live in a time like this, just as God ordained the Maccabees and the people of that time to live in that very, very difficult time. And they were called to shine, you know. One of the reasons why, too, like if you really get into the story of the Maccabees, it's, it's like brutal. I mean, there are people being slaughtered in the street for keeping Sabbath and all this other stuff. 
And one of the reasons the Lord showed me why he calls us to go through times like this is that because people could get so cynical that they get incapable of belief, almost completely inured to any truth, reality, or anything pure or holy. And the only thing sometimes that can break that is if they witness someone paying a price for truth, paying a price for their faith, laying down their life rather than denying their faith. I mean, I think of these people back in the day when when so many defected into Hellenism, they began to worship in their body and their looks, and they began to despise the crippled people and everything like that. I mean, it was just such a world thing. But for people to say no, I'd rather die than not keep Sabbath. I'd rather die than not circumcise my child according to the law of Moses. I'd rather die than deny my God. Believe it or not, that brought a lot of people to faith, okay? People actually can believe even if they've been sinicized when they see a a believer paying the price. And a lot of people, I think, were were moved to faith by those that uh, lost their bed and breakfast because homosexuals were bullying them, or those that lost their job because they wouldn't go along with the transgender thing. This gets attention, and people see it and realize, you know what? Uh, maybe the world's not totally cynical. Maybe there is some truth somewhere. This person seems to be willing to pay the price for it. So that has brought me a lot of comfort. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a good point. So one more time, um, Bill, I'm talking to Bill Randalls. Uh, just can you share the um, where they can find you online once more? Yes, believersingrace.com. That's the name of the church I pastor, believersingrace.com. Or on YouTube, it's Believers in Grace Fellowship channel, where we have more than 500 sermons, and we get, we go through whole books of the Bible. Right now, we're going through Daniel, and uh, I also wrote a bunch of books, and I've got an author's page on uh, on uh, <clears throat> uh, Amazon. And man, I, I really hope some some people will go there because I, I wrote these really good books, but they're not very well known, and I think that people would really, really be edified by them. So. Um, please make yourself available that way too. And then we have a Facebook, uh, Believers in Grace Fellowship uh, Facebook. And that's where we stream our services. And I really invite you to join us. But I also invite you to make sure if you're in that one of those special situations to abide by Malachi 3, 16 through 18. Those who feared the Lord spoke often one with another and their words were written in the book of remembrance and they shall be mine, saith the Lord. Just just remember, we're a pilgrim people. Like if your church goes bad, you got to get out of it. If, it. if it's so bad that it's denying Christ, or if it's so bad that you can't bring someone to it because you're afraid of its influence on them, you you got to quit supporting it. Get out of there and find people of like mind that love Jesus Christ. I hope this is helpful to everybody. And thank you for letting me be on this show, brother. And thank you too, Bill, and I'm sure it won't be the last time that we have you on the Minute to Midnight show. I hope so, and I congratulate you and Holly. God bless you. And God bless you too, and thanks for the um, congrats from me me and Holly. Amen. Praise God. All right, I'll talk to you soon. And folks, remember that you can find all of our shows and articles at a minute to midnight.com and our shows are on um, audio only on iTunes as well and video on YouTube and you can get both formats completely independently of those two platforms on our website a minute to midnight.com and um, we are run 100% by donations and we greatly appreciate those people that do, do donate to help a minute to midnight keep running and if you want to do that, you can also find ways to donate at a minute to midnight.com. And as I say, it's greatly appreciated when people do donate to help us run this. And the music used in the shows I've written, played and recorded, and you can find that music as well as other music on minute to midnight.com. Please bookmark the website and um, remember that we are being censored on some of the other platforms, so it is always a good place to go um, to find shows that have been deleted on YouTube and so forth. Okay, so that's it for this episode. Um, God bless and God willing we'll be back with another show in a few days' time.